Hello and welcome to Brokenomics. Now, I hope you've all had a fantastic Christmas and New Year break. Now, I did, and while I was off, I, I got a chance to really catch up on the comments. Now, there's one particular comment that stood out to me. Callum Nichols says, Can you do a Brokenomics on the book The Sovereign Individual? I just got it for Christmas and I'm reading it now. Well, Callum, yes, I can. Um, and not least because, I mean, I wanted to do this anyway, but uh, this is this is a fantastic book. So I'm, I'm very happy to help out with this one. Right. This book written in 1997. Um, so, uh, you know, a little while ago now, um, as well as giving you a fantastic model for thinking through the challenges that the nation state is, is facing at the moment. They also made a number of predictions. Um, now, the, the predictions were, to give you a flavour, you know, some of the ones they put in there, uh, they predicted the rise of the smartphone before it happened. You know, they said that, you know, internet, phone, video, camera and entertainment would all be rolled into a single device. Um, they they uh, forecast the rise of social media, again, long before it happened. They called it neurocasting, but you know, when you when you hear them describe what they're talking about, it is it is basically social media. They, they predicted that uh, Bitcoin. Again, they gave it a different name. They called it cyber cash, but um, they basically predicted the, the rise of Bitcoin. Um, and, and you can tell again when they're talking about it, they're talking about the use of uh, private public keys. But it wasn't just that. It was also the whole payment infrastructure that was built up around it. And actually, they were getting into some of the challenges that people are you know, talking about now as if it's cutting edge. And they were talking about it over 20, well, 1997, that's 26 years ago now, isn't it? Oh, actually, no, 2024, that's 27 years ago. Is that right? Something like that. Anyway, so they were talking about it a very long time and they were not only predicting the stuff coming down the track, but they were also into the implications and then how it would be adopted and what infrastructure would be built up around it and all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, Bitcoin and the whole payment infrastructure process that built around that. Um, they predicted the rise of Americans giving up their, um, their citizenship in ever-increasing numbers, which is a phenomenon that we are seeing. The only other thing I, I might throw in there is, as, a, as a not so much a prediction, but more as an observation, and they got there very fast. In the second edition of this book, 9-11 um, had happened at that point. And they described Osama bin Laden as the as the Richard Jewell of his age. Um, now, if you don't know who Richard Jewell is, he was he was basically a security guard, I think, at the Atlanta Olympics. Um, and there was a terrorist event, and and this Richard Jewell guy got framed for it by you know the FBI or whoever it was that was looking into it. Basically, this Richard Jewell guy got framed for it. Um, and then you know much later it emerged that actually he had nothing to do with it. And they 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 basically draw a parallel between Osama bin Laden and this, this Richard Jewell guy who got framed. Now, to come out with that in 2001 was quite a bold claim. I mean, I think most of us know now that the official story on 9-11 is completely bogus, but it probably took most of us a while to get to that point, and these people just saw through it immediately. So, um, yeah, you compare, I mean, you compare their predictions to the predictions of a left-wing economist like... Paul Krugman, for example. Paul Krugman famously said that the internet would never have more impact on the economy than the fax machine had. Right. So Paul Krugman looked at the internet and said, you know, it, it, it will have no more impact than the fax machine. And these guys looked at the internet and basically predicted everything that's happened in the last 20 years. So you can sort of see the, the disparity when it comes to right-wing economists and left-wing economists as to how accurate they are. It isn't just politics um, that the, the left and the right split applies. It's, um, it's economics very much as well. So, and in fact, that reminds me of, <laughs> that, that reminds me of in 2008, famously, the Queen asked, after the big um, economic meltdown, the great financial crisis, the Queen famously asked, why did no economist see this coming? And I remember the BBC covering this at the time and having to give some fluff falling over themselves trying to, trying to answer this question as to why no economists saw it coming. The point is that um, a great many economists, a great, great many economists saw 2008 coming, but they were all Austrian economists. They're all my kind of economists. Um, and you don't get any of them working for the Bank of England or the government. Because if you're an Austrian economist, you are drawn inevitably to the conclusion that government should be made smaller. And if you are a Keynesian economist, you are drawn to the conclusion that government should be made bigger. 
So no surprise, the only people who get jobs in the Bank of England and government are Keynesian economists who think that government must always get bigger, which is why they can't predict when their system is going to fall apart. So anyway, yes, fantastic book this. Um, that's not the big prediction in this, though. The big prediction in this is that the nation state is going to fail, that it's going to fall apart. Um, this is this has huge impacts, which I'm going to try and unpack through this through this episode. Um, I can only touch on their arguments, though. I mean, let's let's I give myself you know ninety minutes, whatever, to, to 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 get into this. I can only really touch on the arguments. It is worth um, reading or getting the audio book, um, like um, like Callum did uh, for Christmas. But um, but anyway, I will I will try and unpack the big ideas in here and see if it if it, if it tempts you to, to to look a bit further into some of this. Okay, so they try and reframe your thinking around what the nature of government really is, what what government really is in this era. They point out that you know we are not the clients of the state, the citizens. The citizens are not the clients of the state, because if we were the clients of the state their incentives would be to drive our costs down. And that's not what we observe. Actually, the people in a country are the employees of the state. Um, the incentive of employees is to drive costs up because government spending is basically their wages as a result. If you're an employee, your, your wages are a function of the total spending of the, um, of, of the company. Um, and and that is what we what we actually do see. What we do see is we have a situation in you know the Western world today, where the people who pay the most into government use it the least, and the people who pay the least use it the most. So the welfare state is essentially a way of um, you know increasing the size of the state, um, getting as many people to become an employee of the state as possible um, and basically to squeeze as much as they feasibly can out of as many people as they can. And they go on to talk about how they said by 2010 or thereabouts, they said, um, the welfare state will become simply unfinanceable and they felt the system was going to, um, to fail at that point. I've got to give them half marks on that one because, of course, we had 2008. And what we saw there, we saw that the system should have fallen over, but the magic money tree technicians were skilled enough in order to inflate the bubble yet again. Now, it is very much the case, and I've talked about this in many, many Brokenomics, especially the early ones, that the welfare state, I mean, it is, I mean, it is completely unfinanceable. It just doesn't work. I mean, none of the, none of the maths add up. We are in a debt spiral. The, the size of the, of, of the debt is the same as the size of the economy, and the debt is growing faster than the economy. We are in a debt death spiral at this point. Um, we know that this money is never going to be paid back. We know that debasement is the name of the game. We know that the welfare state is is unaffordable. And all of that was perfectly apparent in 2008. In fact, that was the key point where it went from, oh, this is looking bad, um, what can we do about it, to, yeah, okay, this is this is done. But the magic, the magic money tree technicians have been able to keep the show on the road ever since somehow. Um, so I'm only going to give them half marks for that particular um, uh, prediction because I mean it's I mean I mean they're kind of financing it today I mean kind of um, I mean they they got us into this four year rolling debt turnover cycle um, you know and I think 2024 is going to be the year where we flip from high rates to low rates in order to to start rolling over the debt as i as i talked about probably in uh, in, in an episode a couple of weeks ago um but yeah okay so returning to their big idea their big idea and, and i'll give you a quote from the book the microprocessor um will subvert and destroy the nation state so that basically the nation state cannot survive but it will try and it will fight back as much as it 
can. Um, that in itself sounds like sounds too much, doesn't it? That the microprocessor will destroy the nation state. When you get into, if I, let's describe it like this. So they use history a great deal to explain the sort of paradigm shift that is coming down the track. So I will get into this more later, but they draw a lot of comparisons with the end of the, um, the end of the 15th century. So the end of the medieval era, effectively. And, you know, what they describe there is, is there you had a world where the, the feudal lord and the bishop reigned supreme. But early industrialization was starting to happen. And the town and not the countryside was becoming predominant. And it started a process where that was, that was effectively the peak of the power of the bishop and the lord. And after that, it was a, just a long, long decline from that point forward. Um, and the, the model of the town, the guilds and industrialization, um, ultimately led to another form of government. So feudalism disappeared and democracy emerged. And they feel that, you know, much like, you know, the town or the guilds or the early industrialization, or however you want to describe that transition that went on at the late medieval period, um, we are now entering a digital world. And because of that, the same dynamic is going to play out where you are going to see um, this time, you know, the politician and, and the, um, the mainstream media and the banker are going to, are going to wither away and be replaced by something else, individual sovereignty, effectively. Um, and that in time, we will come to view mass democracy the same way that we view the feudal system today, which is to say it is it is fairly laughable. So, you know, a, a core idea of theirs is that, you know, the rich do get certain benefits from the nation state or have got certain benefits from the nation state for building wealth. But effectively, in the digital age, that becomes increasingly less necessary. So building wealth is less and less reliant all the time on a nation state. And that in turn makes the nation state less powerful because people are opting out of it and they're, they're finding alternatives. Much the same as, you know, the, the, the feudal lord and the bishop were tied to the land. When people started gravitating towards the town, they didn't really have a model for that. They, they, they were unable to respond to it. So let me give you another quote from the book. Um, Often subtle changes in climate, topography, microbiology and technology alter the logic of violence. They transform the way people organise their lives and defend themselves. So an example here is going to be gunpowder. Um, that, was, that was a key factor um, also occurring in this sort of late medieval period. It, it changed the returns to violence and in doing so, changed the effective scale of an optimal nation state, of a, of, an, of, a, of a polity, whatever, how you want to look at it. And they're basically saying that the um, cryptography and the internet, the digital world, is another one of those epoch shifts. Whereas now, like gunpowder increased the returns to violence, this will decrease the returns to violence and it will drive down the under, underlying necessity of, of the nation state. So, another quote from the book. Just as monarchs, lords, popes and potents fought ruthlessly to preserve their accustomed privileges, in the early stages of the modern period, so today's governments will employ violence and covert and arbitrary means in the attempt to hold back the clock. So yes, we don't have monarchs. We don't. Well, we we do. I mean, we we, we do have King. We, we have King Charles the Third now, of course, don't we? Um, and we do have lords and we do have bishops, but they're not really ruling us today, are they? You know, um, you know. In theory, um, King King Charles the Third ha has a role, but in in all practical basis, no, he 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 is not ruling us today. Um, the Lord and the Bishop aren't ruling us today. You know, they were in, in the medieval period, um, and they still exist and they still have functions, but they have they have sort of atrophied away. I mean, I one of my finance jobs, I was sat next to a lord, some guy who grew up in a literal castle. Um, but 
I mean, he I mean he couldn't have my head chopped off because he was in a bad mood. You know, you still have you still have the bishops. You still have the Archbishop of Canterbury wandering around being woke and stuff. But I mean, these, these they're vestiges of what they once were. Um, and perhaps in time, the nation state will start to become, you know, a vestige like that. You know, you still have them, but their their function, their role, their remit has been drastically, drastically reduced from, um, you know, what what it is today in favour of something else. So, you know, back then in the in the late medieval period, we had this unquestioned faith in the divine right of kings, and then from that, the whole feudal system teared down, just like today. We have this unquestioned faith in democracy. You know, who, who, who seriously ever questions democracy? I mean, it's, it's starting to happen a little bit now, so you can tell we're early on this process. But what mainstream figure ever comes out and says, of course, you know, democracy is, is, is a bad idea, you know. Um, and, that, and that's always on the basis that if you, if you advocate that democracy is flawed, and I think we all know that it is. I mean, it is deeply, deeply flawed. If we if we start advocating that it is flawed, people always assume that what you're what you're suggesting is that you go backwards to you know the divine right of kings or the feudal system or something like that. Um, what this book does is it lays out an alternative of a way forward, where it is the it is the the individual that that sovereignty at the individual level that that um, that that will start to emerge more and more and it's driven by the by the logic of the digital world so i mean in their comparison of the in in their criticisms of democracy um you know they're, they're quite good at making it sound pretty absurd for example they, they're given that they, they show you know what would it be like if you walked into a shop and a shop was run like a democracy so you know the people who pay the most uh, receive the least benefit and the distribution of resources is decided by the employees. So, you know, you can imagine going into a, a sofa shop and, um, you know, you pay your money for a sofa. Um, and then the employees of that sofa shop, they then start having a debate amongst themselves about who should receive the sofa. Um, you know, what is the most equitable um, allocation of this sofa? And, and it won't be to you, the person who paid for it. It will be to, uh, it will be to somebody else. <clears throat> That is exactly how our democracy runs at the moment. And you wouldn't tolerate it in any other aspect of your life, apart from your political system, where we do do that. Um, getting, getting change to the system in a democracy is another example they use. So let's say you identify some particularly odious bit of, of government spending you know it's inefficient unnecessary counterproductive you know it's just it's just an awful bit of government spending what does it take to change that i mean it's an ex it would be an extraordinary force of will to get even minor change to any government program for any any particular person because first of all <clears throat> You know, you, you identify this government program that you feel feel needs to go. Um, even if you were hundred percent successful in getting it removed, the benefit to you and all the people that you interact with would be tiny. There would be a tiny, tiny benefit to you. I mean, we, we're talking you know pennies or less than pennies of, of removing a you know a couple of million of, of of government spending from a particular area. So you can't get anyone interested in it. On the other hand. The people who actually work in that um, are hugely motivated and will go to great lengths to resist um, your attempts to get that thing closed down. So democracy is all about, basically, they have been designed in such a way as to drive up government spending as much as possible and extract as much as possible. They make the point that democracies are actually just the, you know, they're, they're not the diametric opposite to, to communism. It's the fraternal twin of communism. The only difference with democracy is when the theft occurs. So in communism, um, they do it all up front. You know, they say, OK, well, we, we, we're going we're gonna to own everything and we're just going to tell you what to do, um, you know, from, from, from the very beginning of the chain. 
in democracies, they basically let that first third occur where it's the, um, um, the, the wealth creation. They, they let that happen and then they immediately jump in and then start heavily, heavily taxing it. Um, and then making the spending decisions that that, that, that go on from that. So, um, in a, and actually, um, democracies are better at extracting wealth than communist systems are. You know, d- democracies are just more efficient at extracting more. And governments today, as a percentage of wealth, tax far more, far, far more than they than they ever have historically. I mean, I think last week's episode was on um, Rome that I did with Bo. And we're talking about the levels of taxation that occurred um, under the Roman system. And for the most part, it was it was one percent. I mean, un- un- under a few extreme periods, it sort of rose into the five to ten percent range. But essentially, government government spending and taxation w- was a a significantly lower fraction of um, total wealth of a nation. Whereas today, um, I think at the peak, UK private sector spending was 52% of GDP. I might be wrong on that, but it was it was it would have been very close to that. So so 50% of government spending sort of, of of GDP was government spending. But then of course you've got to consider that on top of that, there's so a lot of that other 50% that's in the private sector is heavily regulated and heavily steered by government forces. And actually the other, as as I've argued many times in brokenomics half of every transaction is money anyway. So, um, you know, what, what really is the percentage of um, wealth that is being controlled under a, under a democracy? You know, it is, it is um, yes, rather, rather high. So um, when you start to look at it, if you start to look at democracy the, where they, the way they do in this book, you know, what you're seeing is, is you've been told all your life that democracy is unquestionable and it's the best. But actually it is a way to... It is a way to mitigate any particular individual to the greatest possible extent. Let me come back to that actually when I start talking about the the, the, the um, you know the, the epoch shifts. But yes, I will come back. I'll come back to because I have much more to say on that. Right. Um, the other thing they talk about, of course, is you know the the, the bishops of our day are the mass media. Um, now, a quote from the book: the church found that censorship did not suppress the subversive technologies. It merely assured that those um, subversive technologies were put to their most subversive use. Uh, This is, I mean, they're talking about the printing press there predominantly, but, um, you know, we're finding the same thing with social media and memes and platforms and all the rest of it is there is a, there is a desperation from the establishment media to suppress and um, clamp down on what they see as subversive speech and all it's doing is ensuring that 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 speech becomes ever more subversive Um, so there is again you know parallels emerging there they make the point that it is necessarily the case that as government gains sovereignty and they are always trying to do that the individuals lose sovereignty. There is a total amount of sovereignty and it is either held by governments or individuals. So the total amount can't change, but the, but the proportion in it. Um, they feel that we, we are, well, we have either reached or we are close to reaching the maximum amount that government will ever hold. Let's hope that's true. Um, and we're going to start to see the, the, the sovereignty of the individuals increasing. Same logic goes for media, since we're talking about that. You know, when a system loses its logic, and the BBC is is perhaps a prime example of this, you know, the BBC are losing now whatever it is. Um, oh, I'd, 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 I'd have to check my numbers, but the BBC are losing tens, if not hundreds of thousands of um, licence fees um, every month now because the logic of the BBC has changed. I mean, why, 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 do you need, why do you need over-the-top broadcast TV when you can just have streaming TV, when you've got the internet and so on? You know, the, it doesn't matter how much the compulsion, it doesn't matter how much 
you know, laws that they've got written in that says if you watch any um, broadcast TV, you need to pay for the BBC licence fee. The fact is the underlying logic doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and, and as a result, the BBC is, um, well, it's, it, it's, it, I mean, it's dying as a result of, you know, the, 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 the exodus of, of TV licence viewers. It's the same um, process that they believe is, is on the verge of happening or will be happening. In fact, it is happening now um, with the nation state. So, I mean, we now, we've now got to the point with, you know, the mainstream media, I mean, especially over the COVID area, where any attempt to question the official narrative gets you labelled as a dangerous enemy of the state. I mean, in, in Australia, they, they were literally putting people in concentration camps for questioning the media. So they built all those camps and it wasn't just people who tested positive for COVID who went in the camps. It was also people who, would just, who just questioned government policy. We're getting taken and put in those camps. Um, you know, may, may, maybe that was was peak government sovereignty um, and the absolute nadir of individual sovereignty. So, um, you know, that that is possibly the case. I'll give you a quote from the book. The mass media becomes individualised media. No longer will you be at the mercy of Dan Rather or the BBC for news that reaches you. You will be able to select news compiled and edited according to your instructions. Um, this is in the whole section where they go on to talk about the rise of social media, but they're also talking, of course, about the rise of things like um, <clears throat> lotuseaters.com. So who are these individuals who, who wrote this, um, this rather prescient book? Well, there's two of them. Um, James Dale Davidson is one. So he, he, he's an American guy, a uh, writer, an entrepreneur, um, he's, he, I mean, he's best known for his, um, strategic, um, newsletter that he writes, um, strategic investment. I think it is, it's, it's not actually that expensive, that one. It's, um, it's less than a hundred dollars, um, to sign up for that. And he's got his rather contrarian views on, um, you know, international finance and markets. And it's a pretty good newsletter. So, you know, that, that might be worth, uh, worth, worth checking out. He's still writing it today, I believe. Um, he, 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 I mean, he's obviously an older guy now, um, he he got a lot of things right from this uh, from this current cycle. So again, it, it, it's worth checking out. I did watch an interview with him not so long ago. Um, he is he is very much our guy on things like climate change and COVID. So I mean, he, he the way he views climate change is he says I mean, it's, it's it is literally just a, a crony capitalist um, scam. Um, it's the organised transfer of billions from the people to you know the, the globalist elite. Um, he was much harsher even on um, on the COVID stuff. I mean, he he, he just calls them, um, uh, well, I mean, he, he calls them some rather unpleasant things. And he, he, look, he just points out, you know, again, COVID was a massive scam. Um, if you, if, if we had, a, if we had a coffee company and governments mandated um, that, that, that that particular brand of coffee had to be drunk three times a day, you know, you'd make a lot of money as well. Um, especially if you said, okay, if you don't drink the coffee, then you're going to get put in a concentration camp. And some of that coffee money is going to be recycled back to, you know, governments and friends of the people in government and all that kind of stuff. Um, and he viewed, um, I think quite accurately, um, the COVID era as something that really accelerates the discrediting of the nation state. Um, you know, I'd, I'd certainly agree with that. The other character in this, uh, in this book is Lord William Rees Mogg, slightly unusual uh, name that he is of course the father of Jacob Reese Mogg, who you will know if you if you are in the UK. Um, there was that phase, wasn't there, when we all thought that um, Jacob was 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 fairly based, and it turns out no, actually he's a, he's a Tory. Um, but it, but his father seemed quite good from, from 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 how he wrote this. So he was the you know the editor of the Times um, for many years, um, and he also helped out with this this newsletter that. Um, um, yeah, Will it? No, hang on. James Dale Davidson wrote as well, um, and and he continued on in the House of Lords um, with the various interventions. I, I did catch his last speech in the House of Lords, and he was he was talking about um, the factors that would lead to a financial crash. Um, I think this was shortly before two thousand and eight, and he was he was absolutely right on that. So again, he was one of those people who who, who got this right. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.